Well, hello, everybody. This is uh, wonderful. Hey, we're back. Restrictions are off. Look at this. Hey. We're so excited to worship with you today, and uh, Ben McGilvery is going to be bringing the word. He is a man who loves the Lord, and oh, I'm excited. We're in the house of the Lord here. Um, yeah, you know what? A couple things before we start. There are bathrooms in that building over there. You, you don't have to use these outhouses unless you want to. I mean, right now they're baking in the sun, and things are frothing in there. Um, but <laughs> in, inside the building there, there's two bathrooms. If the door's closed, it means don't go in. You understand? It doesn't lock, but we have a trust system around here. Okay? That, it's designed that way. I know it sounds a little scary, but uh, come and give it a go. Let's see how it goes. Um, but yeah, let's pray. Oh, just so good to be together in the house of the Lord. Um, well, we're, well, we're really, next week we'll have many more chairs, by the way. We apologize. We, uh, we undercounted our chairs. All the tough guys can stand on the back wall like they've already started. <laughs> That's where the tough guys stand. Um, yeah, let's, uh, let's pray. I was, uh, I was just really reminded this morning. So, you know, sometimes we come to God and we have these, or even we come to church and our expectation is just so little. Um, this guy named Nathaniel approached Jesus, and, and he was just like, what good could come from Nazareth? In other words, like, I know what, I know what this guy's all about. I know this, this gig, and it's nothing. And, and Jesus says to him, there's a man with no deceit in him. And Nathaniel's like, whoa, how did you know that? And Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree. And Nathaniel's like, you must be God. You must be God. And Jesus is like, are you kidding me? Because I know some stuff about you. That's your expectation of what the Messiah will look like. He said, I will tell you. You will see angels ascend and descend on the Son of Man. In other words, in Jacob's ladder, it was this prophecy of a day when there will be no gap between heaven and earth. Where we will have full access to God. And that's today. And we come to church and we're like, oh, it's going to be a couple songs. I'm, I'm probably going to get some tingly feelings at some point during one of, one of Graham's great chord progressions. <laughs> but what if we decide, you know, what if like the Holy Spirit comes and heals parts of our hearts today? But what if he comes and reveals our true identity to us and just starts to chip away at a lot of the garbage in our life? Like, couldn't he do way more than what we expect or what we've been used to? Like, don't we all sense that revival is coming? Don't we all sense that? Like, in our bones, don't we all sense the fact that, like, we're sick and tired of just the way that things have been in our world? So let's pray, and then we're going to worship. And I just invite you guys to just, let's just do it. We're allowed to sing. So let's just sing loud. We're allowed to clap. We're allowed to shout. We're allowed to hug. So get your hug on, get your clap on, and let's just blow the tent off this place. Yeah. <laughs> let's play, let's pray. So Jesus, God, we confess that we come to you with just these tiny expectations of who the King of Kings is. You said that we have full access to heaven, God. That, that there's no longer this shut door to the heavens, God. That you have opened it, God that we have full access to the Father, and that the kingdom of heaven has invaded earth, and we get access to that this very moment, this very morning, Jesus. I pray that you pour out your, your spirit in this place, God, in your presence, Father. God, I pray that every person in this place would you sense how deeply loved they are by you, God. You say that you didn't come to the world to condemn it, but to save it, God. I pray that anyone here that feels condemned, God, that by your spirit you would just remove that lie. God, no sin is too big to disqualify us from your love. Father, we see you running after us. God, we see you just embracing us, God. I thank you so much for your incredible love for us, Jesus. We're going to do our community prayer now. If you have one of these pages, you can follow along with us. May the God who is community be with us as we seek to be a community. May God bless our dreams and may God shatter our dreams. May God help us to be real and find depth and weakness and brokenness. May God help us to face and grow through conflict rather than pretend by being nice. 
May we look at each other through the soft eyes of respect and compassion, rather than the hard eyes of criticism and condemnation. May God let us let go of control and the need to fix one another. May God help us discover we are needy in our own souls and give attention to our own hearts. May God shape us to be his people until we resemble Christ, who is full of mercy toward the wicked and the ungrateful. Amen. We were thinking of using the car horn as our kind of like... Yeah. Horn, <laughs> Pick up that couple. It's in the key of G. So. <laughs> <laughs>
song or sit down? What do you want to do? One more song. One more song. One more song. So good, isn't it? To come together and all sing together. Really nice. Sounds good. This is a song about um, just resting in the presence of God.
Well, Lord even provided a motorcycle sand at the end. Of the <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't the right kid as well, which is very sweet. It's really rare. Right on. Well, that was lovely. All right, yeah, you find a seat if you can find one. Um, yeah, next week we're going to have two more rows of these whites, okay? And some more shade. It's going to work out, we promise. Um, obviously, this isn't our dream for church. We, uh, we're going to be in a new building in September. And September 12th is our kickoff. It's going to be wonderful. Um, but we want to gather around food every single time. So lots of the lots of the seating area in there is going to be around tables and chairs. So the whole function is that as people come to church, um, we can all sit together and talk together and have relationship together. It's sort of like our primary vision for the church is to be a place of belonging. Um, I'm going to do a bit of show and tell, okay? Check this out. So... Last week was so hot, it was like 40-something degrees, and one of my favorite guys, his name is Hot Wheels, uh, his real name is Corey, um, he's, he's walking, he's going down, scooting down the road, he's got the fastest scooter in town, goes 50 kilometers an hour, with this rock that he found at the lake, and he was sweating, boiling, and he came holding this rock, and I'm like, Corey, why are you carrying that rock, it's so hot! And he said, it's a gift for Metro. He says, I want to just thank you so much. It's a beautiful gift. He said, he said, I just want to give you guys something. And this was it. Is that, see, Corey is a part of our family. Hot Wheels is like, this is a place of belonging. And this is, a, this is our family here. And so we want to we wanna perpetuate that. And we want to make that even stronger. And so in that place, we're going to be building um, a new kitchen. And so the whole function is, so you come to church. You have breakfast together, and not just garbage breakfast. We're talking like eggs, Benny, yeah. yummy <laughs> breakfast. You eat, and then we're going to do church. We're going to talk around tables um, as a part of the message, so there's like conversation. And then we're going to have lunch together. We're going to have like crazy oh, soups every time. And so you're thinking, how are we going to pay for all that? We'll work on that later. But this is what we need to figure out right now is, is we need to build the kitchen to start with. And so we're going to do a little fundraiser with our church family. Um, we're going to try to build the kitchen with, with this group. And so it's going to cost us $80,000. And we really believe that we can raise that in this community here. So even if you could just give $5, whatever you could give, if everyone just contributed, as we come to church, you can see, man, see that piece of that stove over there, that knob? That was me. I paid for that knob right there, or whatever it might be. But we're hoping that every single person can get involved with that. Um, and so there's kind of two ways to get involved. You can like uh, put it just in the little, that little box right there and just mark um, new kitchen. Or if you go on your, your phone or your computer and just go to the church center app, it'll like say select city and then you select Kelowna, select church, metro, and then you can like, you, it, you know, you can give to the building project. It's on the paper. It's on the paper. Lucas put it on the little handout so it explains it all really well. Um, here's another bit of show and tell. So this was done a few years ago, and I love this. This is a big piece of just pottery art. And everybody um, in the community sort of did a little part of it. And there's like some really cool stuff. This hand at the top, and there's just like ton, there's tons of stuff on the inside. But this is sort of family right here. It's just, it's beautiful because it's made up of everybody. Last week we talked about the fact that God wants um, just beautiful diversity racially in his church. If you missed that one, check it out. It's on our, on our website. God wants beautiful community as far as socioeconomic status in the world. And God wants diversity even in leadership as far as gender goes. We really believe that God made his church beautiful and diverse, just like Ariel's beautiful garden back there. And so we want to reflect that in everything that we do. Anyways, if you um, see our this week, Celebrate Recovery, that's Stu back there. Wait, Stu, that's Stu. Yeah, that's Aaron right there. That's his wife. <laughs> There's Drew right there. What a team. Um, every Friday night at Evangel, and our very own Amber Webster Kotak speaking this week. What's she speaking on, you know? Grace. Grace. Excellent. So that's going to be good. So if you're working through really anything in your life, any hurt from your past, any habit, um, that you're just trying to just get victory over any hang up. It's 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 not just recovering from alcohol and drug abuse It's it's many things and we all struggle. So that's every Friday at Evangel. It's really awesome Anyways, Ben's gonna be speaking to us today. We're yeah, come on up Ben. Ben is a beauty <laughs> this, uh, our, 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 our is also be 
going to be like the headquarters, uh, and however that looks, for Youth for Christ. And so Ben's going to be down here an awful lot. Oh, man. We're also going to build a little restaurant in the front. So you guys can come. We can have coffee together. We can talk about how the Oilers are dominating. This is next year. It's going to be really great. And it is going to be great. And then uh, you're going to knock that over. I guarantee it. It's going to be funny. Right beside my show and tell. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you that we're together. Thank you, God, that your word brings us freedom. God, we thank you that your word is a roadmap to abundant life, God. That this, this world has so many inferior truths and inferior ways, but you are the way, the truth, and the life. You're the good one. And Jesus, I pray that you just speak through your brother, or your son, my brother. <laughs> we love him. Amen. Amen. How about you, brother? Hey, I don't want anything for this, Joel, but I do want one of those shirts. I want a metro shirt, um, please, and thank you. And Graham, I love you too, but can you bring that back? Oh yeah. Yeah, I want that over here, thank you. Um, <clears throat> like, and, and just like right in front of me, right? I, don't, I don't even want to touch it because it's so important. Um, oh, I can't cry in the first sentence. Like, I have not been part of this community for long, but it's things like this that make this place so rich. Um, I love, I love, Joel, it's been like three or four Sundays, and I just love the presence of God that just seeps out of this community. It's so rich. Do you guys know what I'm talking about, or am I just like, right? I feel like I'm um, And uh, so, this diversity piece is so huge. And please say hi to Corey. I haven't seen him for years, so please give him a high five for me. Um, but yeah, like this diver diversity piece is huge. Like you can't read through Ephesians. We're going through Ephesians right now. And uh, you can't read through Ephesians without understanding that this body of Christ is universal. That it's big. That God's vision for his bride, his church, was not small it's not this, this box that we can put ourselves in. It's so much bigger and so much brighter uh, than that. And so, you know, we're not going to be talking about anything different than that still this morning. If you have your Bibles, uh, we're in Ephesians chapter 3. Um, and, uh, yeah, chapter 3, we're going to look at verses 1 to 13. Uh, and so, yeah, if you have your Bibles, grab those. That's where we're going to go. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I entitled this sermon for this reason. Um, and it's a weird title, I know, but Paul is weird. And so as I picked up my Bible to begin studying this text, I picked it up and I, I read this, this statement, for this reason. Okay? He doesn't really tell us why. He just starts the chapter with, for this reason. And then Paul goes into this little bit of a, a statement where he talks about how he, he kind of pauses and then he's like, I've been imprisoned for Jesus on behalf of the Gentiles. Okay, he says that statement, and then the statement drops. Okay, so if we're just reading the scriptures, that's where it ends. It's just done. There you go. You know, Corinthians or, or, or Ephesians 3, 1, that's it. Okay, there's actually a literary break in his thought right there. Okay, and so some scholars looked at that. They're like, what's going on? We have to look at it. It's important. We can't just keep reading and so one of the things that most scholars looked at is actually back in, and then in verse 14, so if you read ahead, if you've got your Bible in front of you, uh, so verse 1, for this reason, depending on your translation, some have changed the wording a little bit, but for this reason, and then if we go to verse 14, he says it again. He picks up his thought again. Okay, and so most scholars think this is kind of what's happening. It's important that we understand this because it gives us some context for what we're going to talk about today. But the reason why they think Paul did that is that how many of you guys have had to tell somebody something really, 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 really important? Anybody had to do that? You know, the, that conversation where you have to muster up the courage? Um, I'm going to have a hard time staying in that view. Sorry, but I walk. Um, but yeah, it's like this conversation with like so much riding on it. And you know that the person is going to respond to it. And, and you're going to have to deal with it. And it's hard to sometimes just say things. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, most scholars believe that Paul was actually trying to do that. He was about to just kind of spit something out that was kind of like a big deal. 
And so he says, for this reason, and then he's like, I'm a prisoner in chains for Jesus on behalf of the Gentiles. And then he pauses. Because he realizes that what he's about to say actually has some context. There's, there's got to be a preamble to what he's about to say. So if we were going to think quite naturally what Paul was actually trying to say, he was going to say, for this reason, this is verse 14 now, for this reason, I bow my knee and pray. So that's what Paul was wanting to say. But he pauses for a second and he says, but before I say that, okay? And he did this in chapter 1 and chapter 2. What he was talking about, the context of what he was talking about actually brought him to his knees in prayer. And so he was about to pray, but then he paused. So now we have to ask the question, what was the reason? For what reason, Paul? For what reason do you pause? And any time we get into a moment like this in Scripture, it's really important that we look at what? Context, right? We have to say, okay, what was he talking about? Well, let's look at the context of the Ephesians. Let's look at the context of the text we're in. So if we're doing that, following right through from verse 14 into 15, um, uh, Paul actually begins to pray, and he talks about this idea uh, uh, of the family, okay? And he starts to talk through, and so he says, uh, this is a clue that he gives in 15, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Okay, talks, some other translations focus more on the Father heart of God. And so he's talking again about the universal family of Christ. We're not surprised because he's been talking about it all book, right? We can jump back, so if we, let's jump back a chapter, chapter 2, 19, right? It says that we're no longer, as Pastor Joel preached on last week, right? No longer strangers. We're not aliens anymore, but rather we're fellow citizens, right? In the household of God, right? The dividing wall was demolished, right? There's no more hostility. The Gentiles and the Jews are together. This is the universal body of Christ. There's no, there's no limits to it. Okay? And so that's exactly what Paul is saying. So he's saying, for this reason, for the fact that we are family, and that this family is universal, and it's diverse, and it's beautiful, and it's bigger than any of us can imagine, for this reason, I choose to bow my knee and pray. That's what Paul's talking about. So that's where we find this text, and that's where we land. The crazy thing is that he then goes into this bit of a preamble. And I was trying to figure out how we deal with the middle verses, or verses 1 to 13. And really what it was is I think Paul has kind of had to pause because he couldn't just spit out this truth and not pause for a moment and actually say, this is what this means to me. The fact that the body of Christ is united as one, that there's no more dividing wall, that there's unity, actually affected Paul. It actually became Paul's lifestyle. And that's where right in the very first part he spits out this idea that I, I don't think Paul had a limit as to what he would do for the sake of the body. I mean, I don't know about you, I haven't been chained up yet. But Paul went to prison for Jesus on behalf of the Gentiles. It was his preaching that put him there. Right? And so he starts out and he says, so I don't think there was, there, I don't think there was a point where Paul would have uh, at some point like stopped for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of the family. You know what I'm saying? He was fully in, fully surrendered. There was nothing else holding him back. Right? And it was first to Jesus and second to the family. Does that make sense? And he was concerned because I think some of his readers may have been concerned about this. They would have had a hard time with this reality. They would have been, A, because this was the first time they were hearing that Paul was actually in prison. So they would have been actually like kind of floored that, what do you, what do you mean you're in prison? And then he spits out this idea that it's, I'm actually in prison for your sake. It's actually your fault that I'm here, guys. Right? And so that might have been concerning. Right? And, and, and maybe for you, uh, maybe you remember your first encounters with a true Christ follower. Anybody remember their first encounters with somebody that genuinely was a true Christ follower? Those moments that begin to define the rest of our lives. Because all of a sudden, we look into humanity's eyes and we see Jesus. It's a beautiful thing. And I hope and I pray that the church has done something 
that over the years you've looked someone in the eyes and been like, what's going on here? There's something different here. I need what this person has. Anyone been there before? When you start to see the body of Christ actually become the body of Christ, it's a beautiful thing. And we can talk about the pain. It's real. I don't want to ignore the pain, but today I want to talk about the moments when the body of Christ actually becomes the family. And when we're looking in the eyes of someone and we're like, why would he, why would he do that? Why would he love me like that? Why would he pray for me? Why would he be there for me? Why would he not give up on me? What is in this human being that's caused him to be kind of crazy like this, to stay by me, right? And it's like this thing that possesses us when we're in the body of Christ, that, that, that our fellow human beings are beautiful, and they're worth it, and they're good. And it becomes our, our God-given calling to lay down our lives for them, that they would see Jesus. And Paul wasn't just preaching this. He was doing it. He was in prison. And so he says at the, at the little bit later in verse 13, he actually says, do not lose heart. Don't be discouraged by this. Because these people are looking at him. Why would you do this on our behalf? And he's like, it's my joy. This is what I'm called to do. I'm called to lay down my life for my family because Jesus laid down his life for me. And so Paul shows us right out the gate this amazing commitment, A, to Jesus, and B, to the family. It's this idea of surrender, complete surrender to Jesus. Not my will, but his will. Not where I want to go, but wherever he takes me. And why? for the sake of the family. It's actually for supernatural unity to be able to occur, right? And so he sets this example for us. He lays it out for us in, in such a beautiful way. And so I wanted that to be a challenge for us this morning uh, to kind of see and, and maybe even ask the question, like, what would you do, A, for Jesus, but for the sake of the family? And I, I honestly have a hard time saying that in this community because I, I just see the overflow of Jesus in this community. And so please know that I am your equal. I am not preaching to you. But like, what would we in that, what would we do? Yeah. In that, what would we do? Like what is the limit? Where's the limit that we would lay down our life that the body of Christ would be able to be united? What is our limit to be able to reconcile some of the hurt that the church has done in generations that I wasn't even a part of? But what is the level? What is the limit? Because I think Paul is showing us that, that he would go as far as Jesus would call him, prison and beyond. And so I don't know what the application of that is for us today, but it's so easy for me to let my pride and to let my selfishness get in the way of what Jesus may be calling me to do tomorrow. But what is he calling us to do? What is the depth? Okay, we're going to continue on because Paul continues to preamble. Um, and he goes into this idea. Um, he goes into this idea but of basically, so surrender is the first one that I wanted to talk about. But really, if you're looking at uh, for this reason as we're following through, Paul really comes up with two really clear things as to what he's um, about to do here in his preamble. He's saying, we're the family of God. We're united. The dividing wall has been broken. There's no more hostility. We're all citizens of the household of God, right? And then down to, if you're reading along, uh, verse 8 and verse 9 gets into some nuts and bolts of kind of what he's doing here, right? And, and so the one is that, that he would preach, right? That he would preach, verse 8 says, preach to the Gentiles of the unsearchable riches of God. Okay, so it's a really clear statement. This is what Paul says. God has called me to go and to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of God. And so I wanted to pause there because I think this is another thing that Paul did that we get to mimic, that we get to come alongside of and try to do. To preach. I don't like that word. So I've kind of switched it to share, to share, right, um, to the Gentiles. Again, put it in context. This is nation, many nations. This 
word Gentiles actually says that this is a, a universal, far greater reach than we could ever imagine. So it's the kingdom of God on a large scale, preached to the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of God. Okay, it's interesting that he uses the word riches here. Is he talking about money? Maybe. Okay, but I said, right, Jesse, you remember last week at the end of the service, you remember what I said to you? This place is rich. Okay, Joel just asked you for money. I'm not talking about money. But this place is this place is rich. Do you guys get what I'm saying? It's rich. And so when we talk about this idea of riches that are unsearchable in Jesus, riches are anything that actually satisfies a need or a want. Anything that satisfies a need or a want. Okay, body of Christ, have you ever had Jesus satisfy a need or a want in your life? Yeah. Is, is there an ending to it? There's no ending. My brother Chris is here. I said I wouldn't pick on you. <laughs> He's a chef. He doesn't always have a pantry full of food. But if you gave him one, he would make you a meal. I promise you this. But what, what he's talking about, this idea of unsearchable, is this idea that, that you're hungry, that there's a need, that there's a want in your life. And then so you turn around and you go back and you open the pantry. Okay, but when you open the pantry, the options, the resources, the, 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 the taste that is capable because of this pantry, because this pantry is unsearchable. There's no end to it. You're not going to be able to find everything. There's so much you can't even begin to search the depth of what is in this pantry because it's all there. It's all there. You see, Jesus' love for us, okay, is unsearchable. There's lots of wonderful people in my life that showed up today. And uh, Jazzy's here, walked in. I had no idea she was even in town. And I was praying with her. And some other young people one night. And I just remember the love of God coming into that room and ministering to us in such a deep way. And I was praying for her, and I just got this imagery, and it was kind of like a couple kids sitting on, on the uh, down at the beach. Okay, imagine a couple kids sitting at the beach, and they had sand shovels and, and buckets, and my kids love to dig in the sand. And I just saw these kids digging. They were digging in the sand. And I was like, Jesus, like, what is this? Like, what are you, why are you showing me this? And, and uh, I, I immediately got this idea that they were digging a hole to China, right? You hear that? <laughs> and so, and the hole just kept getting deeper and deeper. And then the Holy Spirit just started to just well something up inside of me. And he's like, Ben, you won't arrive. Like, China's not far enough. Even if you could dig to the other side of the world, you will never arrive at the depths of my love. You will never arrive at the depths of what I can provide for you and your family. And I'm talking about the family. We cannot search the depths of Jesus' love. Do you guys understand that? And I hope and I pray that you've experienced his love in that way, that it floors you for just a second to realize that it's so much greater and bigger than you that you will never fully fathom it. Yeah. But you see, when we experience it, and when we begin to walk in the unsearchable riches of Christ, it should overflow. This is that moment I was at CR. On Friday night, amen, love CR. And uh, there was a testimony, and this lady said that, that Jesus had done so much in my life that people from my past would look at me and double take. They couldn't believe the restoration and the beauty that Jesus had created in my life. When the Holy Spirit interacts with us and the unsearchable riches of Christ flow through us, it's impossible for the world around us to not see it. Do you know what I'm saying? And that's why I don't like the word preach, because this isn't about preaching. It's about the fact that our interaction with Jesus is so real and so rich that it begins to overflow to the world around us. Amen. That's the sharing I'm talking about. It's so supernatural and it's so impacting in us that the world around us can do nothing but realize that it's real and it's true and it's there and they long for it. They long to be part of the family. 
Graham, I'm going to pick on you a little bit because I've been so impacted by your ministry. Um, I, I didn't know you six months ago. Um, and that song that you sang last week, like, just tore my heart out. And, you know, the chorus was something like, your skin is beautiful. Jesus thinks that your skin is beautiful. Oh, amen. But that's, that's a little taste of when the Holy Spirit, the unsearchable riches of Jesus, begin to overflow out of who we are, our very being. There's reconciliation that needs to be done in this world. And the only way the body of Christ is going to be able to represent Jesus is if we allow his unsearchable riches to impact us first. And that it would overflow from that place into the world around us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Joel, you want me done at 11? Is that the plan? <laughs> yeah, somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Verse 9, Paul begins to talk about this idea that for the sake of the family, that he is going to bring to light for all to see the manifold wisdom of God. He's going to bring to light, and I love that analogy. Bring to light, to uncover. It reminds me of Matthew 5, right? Matthew 5, 16. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light for who? Everyone. Everyone in the house. Who's supposed to be in this house? Everyone. It's our job to uncover the light of Christ. To take the basket off. To take the bowl off that, that nobody in our home would stumble around in the darkness. I don't know what that means to you. But to me, that means that nobody, nobody in this beautiful home that Jesus has given us should stumble around in darkness while I can do something about it. Nobody. It needs to be uncovered. Okay, it's the wisdom of God, right? The manifold wisdom of God. What is he talking about there? Remember, we talked about context. What is Paul talking about when he says the manifold wisdom of God? He's talking about the mystery that's been uncovered. What's the mystery that's been uncovered? That Jesus died for everyone, for all of us. That this is the kingdom of God. This is his creation, and everybody within these four walls of his creation need to have a lamp on their feet. And if we have the light, then we better well uncover it and let them see. The manifold wisdom of God is that. The mystery was made known that the Gentiles, likewise the Jews, are heirs to the same promises. It's right there in verse 6. The same promises, the same family. And our job is to uncover that for all to see. Now, Paul takes it up a notch, though I'm not even totally sure how to deal with this one. But apparently, when we uncover the light of God's manifold wisdom, it actually affects more than just the flesh realm. But the principalities and the authorities, right, scholars can all, they argue. Some say, well, this is the angels that see this, and uh, this is the, yeah, they all see it. When we are part of unraveling the mystery and uncovering the light of Christ to our world around us, even the demons notice. Even the angels look in awe. You guys understand the implications of that? The demons flee and run the other way and the angels rejoice because heaven's coming to earth. It's our job to uncover the manifold wisdom of God. And we can't get too crazy about that. What is the wisdom of God? Yes, we need to listen to Jesus first and foremost. We learned that in, in, in Paul's surrender. Right? Paul surrendered first to Jesus. So yes, you should wake up every morning and ask Jesus where he would like you to go. And yes, you should be obedient to him. But this wisdom is really specific right here that Paul's talking about. And that's that what was hidden from the many nation or many ages 
And the mystery is now being uncovered in the fullness of time. Amber talked about that two weeks ago. In the fullness of time, uncovering the reality that this is a universal kingdom of God and everybody is welcome and everybody is invited. And my wife is calling me. Should I answer? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I think she knows I'm preaching. It's a sign. It's a sign. <laughs> um, I do want to just uh, pray. Um, but yeah, man. Would we first surrender? Would we secondly share? And would we thirdly shine? For the sake of the family. The family that God has called us in. Not the family we choose. Not the easy one. But would we surrender first to Jesus? Would we share the unsearchable riches of Christ within us? And would we shine that all the world would see his manifold wisdom? Jesus, I, uh, I again am so grateful for this community. Thank you, Jesus, that uh, you gave us an example in Paul that he was willing to lay down his life, that Jesus so clearly, he was so completely surrendered to you, and the oh, Holy Spirit, we long to be like that today in the world around us. And I, again, thank you so much for this church and for this community. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would continue, continue to allow your love and your beauty and your mystery and your wisdom to flow from this place, Father, first in our hearts, and that it would overflow from in our hearts to those around us. We love you, Jesus, and we give you the glory. Amen. Amen. We'll give him a shirt. We'll give him a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. So we're going to um, take communion together. So I don't know who the, who the volunteers are to hand out, but if we could do that, that would be really awesome. And today we're going to have an open mic as well today. So uh, if you've got something to share, you can formulate it in your head and then uh, let us hear what you have to share. So let's just give out the uh, communion elements, that'd be great. It might take a while. <laughs> it's so good to see so many people. But wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. <clears throat> I think uh, should just Zach should come and play the drum while the communion's being put out there. Give us a bit of a drum solo on one box. You want to do that? Come on. This is going to be good. And you've got to clap your hands as, as he's doing it, okay? You ready for this? And then when the yeah? next oh, no. starts, we know yeah. Yeah. Yes, okay, here we go. Come on, Dad. Do your thing.
I was reminded when Zach was playing then that um, the drum is probably the, the oldest instrument on the earth. It's, it's a very in, interesting thing. And it, it, there's something about when you hear uh, drums and you hear rhythm like that, that it's, it really, God's spirit resonates with it because it's such an ancient sound. You imagine the first uh, people, I don't know if they stretched skin over something or just banged on a, on a log or whatever it, where, whatever it was. It's such a deep sound. Uh, I just love hearing just drums. It, it, it really is a, it's a Holy Spirit thing. Do you feel like that as well? Yeah. Do you hear it? Yeah. It's, it's a very, very beautiful thing. So we want to just thank Ben for what he shared today. Yeah. That was um, a beautiful um, reminder of, um, of God's love for us and the fact that um, uh, what he, what he wants, he wants us to shine. I love that idea of taking off the, the lid off of the bowl. If you, if you light a lamp, you don't stick it under a bowl, you put it on, on, a, on a lamp stand. You put it on a high place so that everyone can, can see. And we want to be that, don't we, as a community? We want to be light bringers and light bearers. And uh, I love the, the invitation that no one in, in the house should walk in darkness. That is such a beautiful invitation to us, isn't it? So um, let's take communion. Really take in um, just the person of Jesus as we take uh, the bread together. And, um, and let's, uh, can I have a piece of the bread? Sure. We've got to share it, see? <laughs> Bless you, my <laughs> So let's, uh, let's do that. Let's just take the bread. Remember that it's Christ, it represents Christ's body uh, that was broken for us. And, it, and even this bread all came from one loaf, as it were, as we eat it together. May God unite us and bring us together, even as one loaf, as it were. So let's take it in the name of Jesus. Meet us, Jesus, we ask. Meet us. Meet us as we be fellowship. Even as we partake in the bread, we ask that you'd meet us. You heal us, deliver us. On the night he was betrayed, he took a cup and he said, This is the cup of the new covenant. And um, when you um, drink of it, then uh, you should uh, remember me. And the, and the whole idea of this is that it represents the, the blood of Christ that was shed for us, shed for our sins, and um, brings cleansing to us by, by the power of what he sacrificed on the cross. So we take it in Jesus' name. sing a song together? Sure. Yeah. And then we'll, then we'll do the open mic. Is that right? Even if it's not all right, that's what we're going to do. <laughs>
Yeah. 